Thank you for joining us uh, for today's webinar on the crisis in innovation, transformation and digital together with Mark Sawaki. Uh, my name is Rosalie Ursman and with our company Voyage, we help our clients already for more than 12 years to basically uncover what's next. So we uh, do a lot of research on technological, uh, societal, economic and business developments. Uh, we organize challenging uh, educational programs for our clients, learning programs and uh, we connect them to business leaders, innovation leaders, and research leaders worldwide. Uh, we often do that by taking them on inspiring trips to destinations all over the world. And uh, at the moment, we of course can do that also via digital journey. So that's what we're doing now uh, together with you here. Um, we, uh, especially nowadays, feel it's very uh, important for uh, our clients to continue to look outside and see what's happening in the rest of the world and see what you can learn from that. Um, so we are ready to start with Mark's uh, presentation, um, all the way from San Francisco. Uh, many of you have met Mark before on our previous trips to a voyage to Silicon Valley, and Mark has a long-standing relationship with the Netherlands. Uh, he has lived here for seven years and is still very active in the Dutch market. And uh, we always warn our Dutch clients to be careful what to say, uh, because Mark actually understands Dutch. Um, Mark is a business strategist, a board advisor, management researcher, author, keynote speaker, and investor. And since 2001, he has worked for more than 400 clients worldwide uh, on topics like growth, strategy, innovation, business, and corporate development, organizational change, and a variety of people issues like leadership development. He has worked in over 80 countries uh, for clients in a variety of sectors, and he's also a strategic counsel for governments like the European Union or the Netherlands or other countries. In the Netherlands, he's also working together with TechMeep, uh, a community in the Netherlands for the tech community, and uh, with a special envoy, our Dutch prince, Constantine of Orange. So, uh, Mark, good morning, uh, very early morning for you. Um, we are going to switch off our cameras now, and uh, the screen is all yours. Years working primarily in Europe, but also throughout the world, uh, I've noticed some very disturbing uh, signals inside of, of ITD, what I call innovation, transformation, and digital. So these topics I'm going to lump together, uh, and I want to share with you what I, what I think is going on. I'm going to talk for about 30 minutes, and then I hope for the for the remainder of the hour uh, that we can do Q&A. So please type your questions into the chat box and uh, Rosalie and her team will be prioritizing those and kind of condensing those and, and we'll have a, a dialogue uh, beginning right around uh, uh, 4.35, uh, about 35 past. Let me summarize uh, what I think is going on. Um, I, I have a view supported by lots of data that I'll share with you in a moment that innovation, transformation, digital initiatives are overwhelmingly not delivering strategic or financial outcomes in large organizations. Um, secondarily, the kind of innovation, transformation, and, and, and digital we're seeing in, in organizations um, is incremental. And I would describe that as necessary, but insufficient uh, as we look at the decade ahead. Um, thirdly, you, you know, if you're if you're facing attackers, if, if, the, if the change on the outside is greater than the change on the inside, as, as Jack Walsh likes to say, my strong view is you're gonna have to adopt an entirely new model and a new mindset for thinking about strategic and transfer, transformative ITD that, that, that really delivers both to the top line and the bottom line. And, and fourthly, to summarize today, there's this real paradox uh, that, that's emerged in the last two months. And the paradox is it's never been a greater time to innovate. We just look at all of the sectors that are, that are under massive, massive upheaval. And you can look at it and say, this is great news. But the paradox of that is budgets are going to be reduced. Uh, our share prices are, are, are going to be depressed. Uh, we're, we're sacking people all around the world. I just read 30 minutes ago that you know, a large UK energy group is letting go 2,600 people. So the, this paradox uh, that COVID has introduced is plenty of opportunity, but, but large multinationals are going to be further restrained and constrained from, from going after it. So 
this is what I call the playbook of big dreams. And the playbook of big dreams says something like, we better disrupt ourselves before somebody disrupts us. Hey, we better become a platform company and let's open an innovation lab and let's become world-class at customer experience and design thinking. And let's join an accelerator and play with cool startups. And let's open a corporate venture capital arm and also invest in cool startups. And let's change the culture of our entire company. Um, let's hire innovation Sherpas and full stack magicians and agile ninjas and blah, 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 blah. Or, hey, my favorite, let's go build an exponential organization. Um, these are the big dreams. And let me share with you why these big dreams aren't happening. Well, here is, uh, this is a very small font slide. By the way, these slides will be distributed later. Rosalie ha will have a copy of these exact slides. Or if you want to find me online and, and exchange information, we can do that as well. And I can, I can send these to you. Here's some hard data. We know that only 8% of large organizations around the world can grow by 5% a year for five years in a row. Um, that study was first done by Rita McGrath at Columbia University back in 2012. We repeated that in 2015. And again, this, um, this first data point, we're currently doing this exercise uh, yet again. Um, we know that at any given time, um, one third of all large multinationals around the world are under some severe TSR, some severe shareholder threat. Uh, that number has spiked obviously in the last two months. Um, McKinsey says that of the executives they survey, only 8% believe their business model is going to remain viable. Um, Deloitte says that 96% that of, of all corporate innovation uh, initiatives fail to make a return on investment. Uh, another McKinsey data point is 94% of the executives they survey says their firms are dissatisfied with their innovation performance. Um, this, this, you know, 83% of digital transformations fail. This is the backdrop of our, of our playbook of big dreams. Un overwhelmingly, uh, I, I, I firmly believe the results aren't there. And that's not to say that people aren't well-intended and they're not trying, um, but, but this, is the, this is the data from a lot of reputable firms. So, up until the, the last week of February, I'd been spending a lot of time on long haul flights. In fact, the last time I was on an international flight, I was leaving Amsterdam for, uh, for San Francisco. And when you sit on planes, you, you think too much uh, sometimes. And I began to structure a framework to say, what's really going on here? When I go and, and see the, 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 the intentions, and I've been, I've been in hundreds of these innovation labs around the world, and I've talked to hundreds of of executives at, at, at leading companies around the world. And I think you can put the challenges of innovation and transformation and digital really into five buckets. You've got structural issues, you've got organizational issues, you've got methodology issues, you've got what I call behavioral, political, and cultural. I've lumped all those together. And then at the end, you've got what I call adversarial issues, right? I don't think most of your consultants are getting paid to fix problems and get out of the way. Um, but we'll, we'll touch on that in the Q&A if you want to. Um, but, but these are the five buckets of problems that I see, you know, very well-intended innovation teams uh, and, and transformation and digital teams fighting. This is, this is the, 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 the challenges a CDO faces. This is the challenge um, the, the, the team leading transformation faces. Um, and if we had more time or in the Q&A, um, you know, one of my favorites is, uh, is item three, the methodologies I believe large companies are following when you really follow the logic, they're not working. And so if you want to ask questions about that or what's behind that, I'd be delighted to be delight, delighted to elaborate. So let's, let's pause for a moment. Let's back up. All of the, you know, multinationals keep forgetting that all of our innovation and transformation and digital, all of our cultural you know, interventions, our, our learning and development stuff, our innovation labs, our startup engagement programs, hackathons, you name it. All of that stuff is a means to an end. We're innovating because we want to affect the performance and growth of the company. We're changing the culture or trying to change the culture because we want to affect the performance of that company, right? In, in capital markets, we're trying to grow the business. Uh, that, that's a strong assertion here. And 
that growth is not happening. Um, I, uh, we're pulling the numbers uh, this month as we speak. We're doing some research around what the, what's really happening in the AEX. Um, I, I took a very cursory look before this call in preparation last week. And the AEX, the, the, the largest Dutch publicly traded companies, January of 2000 was trading roughly at 630. And January of 2020, it's largely trading right around 630. In 20 years, there's been no real growth as a basket of goods in the AEX. Now, you could argue they have dividend policy and we're paying some dividends, okay. Um, but is that sufficient? Are, are, are these interesting growth companies that are attracting top quartile talent and that are building new business models to be, remain relevant in the decade ahead? And I politely argue that they're not, that the data is against them. So we have to keep reminding ourselves, you know, and I ask these innovation executives around the world all the time, where is this innovation tied to the performance of the business? Can you show me what you're doing is, is affecting the top line growth of the firm or the bottom line profitability of the firm? And they always tell me to come back and, and check later, which I keep doing. Look, I, th I think at a high level, multinationals need to pause and, and they really have four choices. When you look at the, the, the discouraging data, and I don't mean to be cynical, I'm trying to be Dutch, I'm trying to be direct, but, but your choices are really, I learned that in Dutch, I, 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 your choices are really four options. You can continue your existing approaches to innovation, which I don't believe are working, Secondarily, you can just stop the innovation, transformation, and digital stuff entirely. Maybe you don't need to do much of that. Maybe you can just be a fast follower. Thirdly, you can just return cash to shareholders. Let the shareholders decide better how to invest uh, surplus and, and, and let, let efficient markets work and whatever dividends you provide them and how you pay out excess surplus, let them decide. Or fourthly, try something new and different and bold that may provide results. And you can go chase your playbook of big dreams again. But Minister Fuller famously said, you never change things by fighting the existing reality. If you really want to change something, build a new model that makes the existing one obsolete. It's a, it's a famous quote by his, and I, I bring it up today because it's very relevant to, to this afternoon's conversation. If you recall earlier when I said, you've got these structural issues, this thing on the left is the existing core business. And just imagine a big Dutch multinational that, that maybe you work for now or worked for in the past. On the left, that picture could be, it could be Philips, it could be Kyle M, it could be Ian K, it could be Avian Amro, it could be Rabo, it could be Dai Sim. Any large Dutch company is on the left. And my assertion is that company is built for stability, reliability, and predictability, and it's focused on short-term results, short-term profits. It's being measured in quarters. And financially, it's being measured in quarters. And then we put all of our executives on a, on a performance system. Say, if you deliver those financial results, I'm going to pay your bonus. Your, your own personal financial reward is paid on the financial, financial performance of the company. So this isn't a Dutch problem. This is a public company problem all around the world. We have focused our our, our companies to be too short-sighted. Now, when I talk to executives around the world, they know all the buzzwords, they know all the jargon, they, they, they can tell me, you know, they've heard all the words, but, but it's my view when I, when I interrogate them and I get closer to what they're really thinking, they're, they're not worried about the technological singularity and they're not worried about AI and they're not worried about these things that may not affect them for five or more years because they're, as we say in English, they're coin operated, they're focused on the short term results. And so what I see emerging is 
the realization that we run two businesses. We run the existing core business. This is a, a business that large on the left that largely has slow growth. It's ticking over at three or 4% a year. You could, you could be slightly negative and say that it's in a long, slow decline. Um, but, it, but it, you know, it, it probably lays off a lot of people. It probably has a, a business model that's 75 or hundred years old. And when I really look at all the innovation efforts, they're trying to pack all of the buzzwords and all of the slogans and all of the techniques and all of these fancy things into that core business. Well intended, but it's like jamming a, a, a square peg into a round hole. It's, it's not going to fit. And so what's emerging is come to the realization you run two businesses. Here on the left, you run the core business. It's good for incremental innovation. And by the way, incremental innovation to me doesn't really count. That's called doing your job. <laughs> if you've got an existing product or service and you're kind of modifying it over time, is that really innovation? I, that's another debate. We can maybe talk about that in the Q&A. But the incremental stuff, necessary but insufficient. Remember, I said that earlier. But over here on the right, the question becomes, how many new billion euro businesses can you build in the next decade? Uh, you know, how many new unicorns can you build over here on the right to supplant the long, slow decline you have here on the left? And, and my assertion to you is, by doing it over here on the right, you have a much better chance. You're starting with a clean sheet of paper and you can put all the, you know the answer, you can put all the mechanics in place to, to have your best shot at high growth versus trying to do it on the left where the organization and the politics and the culture and the behaviors is gonna eat you alive. It's been eating you alive and you, you know that. So you're gonna to have to do it over here on the right where you have some fighting chance to succeed. So as I said earlier, the ultimate goal is how many new billion uh, Euro businesses, high growth businesses can you build in the next decade to replace that declining revenue in the, in the core business. And this edge, I call it edge, is your best opportunity to do so. Some case studies. And I call these edge-like. There's, there's different flavors here. The, the grandfather, Opa, is, uh, is Lockheed. Uh, Lockheed is a 75-year-old case study in edge, uh, what I call edge, new organization. And it goes back to the middle of World War II. It's 1943. Uh, the Germans are more advanced in, uh, in jet propulsion technology. And the U.S., uh, uh, we call it the State Department, the, the, the War Department, as it were, they went to Lockheed and they said, guys, build faster rockets because the Germans are better at this. And a bunch of engineers shrugged their shoulders and says, we can't do it. You know, we're engineers and we have to be very methodical and we're slow moving and we're bureaucratic. And one engineer raised his hand and said, you know what, if you leave us alone, you let us move across the... Uh, the city and just leave us entirely alone and let a small determined team go at it, we can do it. And, and that's where we get the word skunk works. And we use skunk works sometime in innovation and nobody knows where it comes from. Skunk works goes all the way back to the 1940s and Lockheed is the first case study I can find that did this. Um, I'm going to skip some of the tech ones, the Apple, IBM, LinkedIn, etc. I'm going to point to a few in Europe uh, that you should find interesting. I'll skip Alphabet as well. Uh, AXA. We all know AXA is the large French insurance group, 130,000 people. And they formed something called AXA Next, N-E-X-T. And what I'm sharing with you is publicly available. You can look around and find it on the internet. What AXA did was they said, look, we're going to set up. First, they said, our business is changing. Um, risk is changing in insurance. People are living longer. That lowers premiums. Cars are safer. That lowers premiums. You know, we have some strategic challenges to, to running a business. The, they, the second thing they said is no consultant shows us any case study to change 130,000 people. No cultural intervention is going to change 130,000 people. Forget that. Leave them go, do what they're going to do. Let's set up an edge organization 
And in that business, we're going to put all of the tools of innovation. And there's four tools. I can buy things, I can build things, I can partner with others, and I can invest in things. Buy, build, partner, and invest. I'm going to put all those four tools together in a single entity. That entity has profit and loss responsibility reporting outside only to the supervisory board and CEO, not through the existing business. And, and they're going to be tasked with building as many new billion euro businesses in the next decade as they can. If it's fast moving, I can acquire it. If it's slow moving, I can partner. But I'm going to also put in all of the incentives to, to make that successful. So all the startups I build in there, I'm going to give them equity. When I do CVC, corporate venture capital, I'm going to give them carry. So all of the mechanics that you see happening in the digital world, you see happening maybe in my neighborhood in Silicon Valley, the, the, the stuff you read about in the books about the Googles of the world, they design into that edge organization. Philip Morris, the, the, the cigarette company, they, their research, they came to the startling realization that their products are killing people. <laughs> and they're killing more people than new people are taking up smoking. And the CEO said, we are out of the cigarette business in 20 years. It's done. It's, in fact, it's falling at about 5% per year already. And they said, we need to go into entirely new segments. And they did some quick analysis and they set up an edge organization. They said, look, we have a half a million farmers around the world that sell a tobacco product to us. They're, they're, they're not, we don't own those farms, but they're captive to us. What other high growth things grow in those locations that tobacco grows and they, they identified all kinds of herbs and, 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 and plant product that can be used in medicines, et cetera. And they're, they're moving their, their tobacco farmers to sell other high margin uh, plant products that have uh, health benefits. And remember they launched ICOS, the uh, HMB, the heat not burn uh, vape device. Um, they, that's an internet connected device and they believe that um, they compete with Fitbit. They will tell you today that that is a health monitoring device in somebody's hand. Now, this is a, this is a mind boggling shift from a 180 degree shift from a, a product that kills people to literally Philip Morris transforming into a healthcare company. Now, I don't think they're going to call it Marlboro Health. Uh, probably going to have to hire a branding expert, but they're making a 180 degree pivot and they're doing that on the, on the edge on the outside of the organization. AB InBev has, uh, has a, uh, an edge organization called uh, ZV Ventures run out of New York, not out of, uh, not out of Louvain. I think, I think AB InBev is still headquartered in, in Belgium, um, South, Ho South, South Holland. Uh, but, but they're running an edge organization in another part of the world. Orsted, the Danish energy group, um, using an edge-like model, they shifted from 100% uh, black coal business to 100% uh, green or, or renewable. And that was 100% domestic in Denmark to six years later, 100% international. And they did that also leveraging an edge model. Um, Alphabet, I only mention Alphabet, you know, all know Alphabet as, as the former Google. Um, when they created Alphabet, I think people were scratching their heads saying, what's going on here? Um, and and the, sh the short answer is Alphabet flew out to uh, Nebraska and they met with Warren Buffett and Sergey, Larry and Eric got all their inspiration from Alphabet from Berkshire Hathaway. And so Alphabet is, the, is another form of an edge-like organization where they're basically gonna sit and they're gonna allocate resources to a portfolio of, of Google companies where, the, where they can apply the best resources. And it makes them challenge uh, synergies. And do we really need the synergies we need? Uh, historically, we thought synergies were really important um, but you could argue that Warren Buffett, the, the best investor in the last 50 years, has created a remarkable, port remarkable portfolio of high growth assets without any integration at all, without any synergies at all between them. So th that's a highlight of the case studies. 
Now, this is really the last slide and we're gonna start turning this over to Q&A in the next five minutes. People will say to me at this stage, but we're already doing that. And I say, are you? And they say, yeah, we're doing that. And so I hold up this list and I'm saying, okay, here's a checklist of what I think an edge organization looks like. These are the characteristics of my definition of edge. And, and then they start getting a little nervous and, and then they start admitting to me. So in, in, in February, I was in the UK and I was meeting the head of group innovation for, for one of the UK's largest public companies. You'd know the company well by name. And this executive said, yep, we're doing that, Mark. And then I held up this list and this person acknowledged that six of the eight items on this list were aspirational, meaning they haven't done them yet. Like, okay, we're headed there, but we're not doing them. And so, you know, this two-track approach, you're running the day-to-day -day business and separately, this new edge business is for double-digit growth. And, and again, that edge organization doesn't in, report into the core. It reports to the board and to the, super, uh, to the supervisor board and the CEO. And it has a mandate for new strategic growth, double-digit growth. It, it, it has a mandate to disrupt thyself, to attack thyself. And, and this, this slogan I see everywhere, and I've seen it many places in the Netherlands. You know, I walk into an innovation lab and right on the wall it says, we better disrupt ourselves before somebody disrupts us. And it's a beautiful slogan, but it doesn't happen in real life. And it doesn't happen in real life because somebody in that core business has p &L responsibility for revenue and they're not gonna let you attack it, period. Um, it's already, what, it's already uh, half four, call it five in uh, Netherlands. You've all used WhatsApp today. Now ask yourself for a moment. You think about when WhatsApp came out. You know, all, all the big mobile operators in Europe, they knew about it, they saw it, right? Vodafone saw it, Orange saw it, uh, uh, Deutsche Telekom saw it, O2 saw it, uh, Telecom Italia saw it, Telefonica saw it, they all saw it. And they all had infinitely more resources than that, that small 30 person team sitting down in, uh, in Mountain View, not far from where I'm sitting this morning. But nobody took it on because at every one of those headquarter companies I just mentioned, those large mobile operators, somebody said, there's no way you're gonna attack my revenue. There's no way you're gonna attack it because that's how I get paid my bonus and that's how my team gets paid their bonus. So you need to disrupt yourself because if you don't do it, somebody else will. That's so illogical. But again, the, the incentives and structures aren't there with you. So in this core edge model, if you attack it from the edge, you're still keeping the revenue of what derivative product ultimately comes out of that, you're still keeping that in the group. But, but take, take, take Vodafone. Vodafone, as huge as it is, or Telefonica, as huge as it is, infinite resources couldn't take on a 30-person startup that was dramatically underfunded because they were protecting core revenue and they're thinking too short term uh, about it. And, and all of these uh, tie together. And, and, and what I find is when people say they're doing it, and I show them this list, it's, it's, it's aspirational. They're, they're not doing it. In fact, sometimes when I talk to CIOs, they get confused and they see the word edge and they start talking to me about edge computing and cloud computing. And I said, you, you've, you've missed the message. Uh, I have to explain to them, this has nothing to do with IT architecture. So little problem there. Um, and number seven, I, I briefly mentioned it earlier, pay these entrepreneurs equity, you know, and then you can compete for top quartile talent, but pay them equity um, so, you can, so you can get great people. And then lastly, very, very important, when I drew those two circles earlier, it's not the idea that you're gonna launch edge businesses and then bring them back into the core. My strong assertion is when you build these high growth, double digit edge businesses, leave them alone 
and run a portfolio of high growth businesses. And if they somehow need to work with the core because they need distribution or they need the balance sheet or they need the brand or something, then find a way to do that uh, with a partnership, but do not quote, fold them back into the core. What, why you think about this? And, and this is, this has historically been the logic. Why would you take a high growth asset? Imagine you built a three, four, 500 million euro business after three years. And imagine it was growing at double digits. Imagine you're holding on to the reins of a, of a unicorn. Why would, you, why would you let it go into the corporate and, and, and hand it over to senior executives that have never managed a high growth asset? Makes no sense. And this is what we keep doing. So we have to break that thinking. We have to break that model. That model's proven not to work. So Peter Drucker, you know, the greatest danger in times of turbulence isn't the turbulence. It's acting with yesterday's logic. And I'm asking you, you know, this was only 30 minutes this, this afternoon, but I'm asking you, we've got to forget yesterday's logic because the results aren't coming in and we've got to, we've got to rethink a lot of things. I, I, I sometimes call this presentation rethinking everything. We, we literally have to rethink and be open to new ideas and be accepting that the, that the approaches that we've been doing to date haven't been giving us results. I'm two minutes over. I said 35 and it's 37. So we're here, it's Q&A. The next 23 minutes are, are yours. I've not been seeing the chat box. Uh, we do. <laughs> I, hope, I, I hope this has been at a minimum entertaining. Um, what, uh, what questions are coming in? Yes, yeah, so we have several interesting questions coming in, trying to figure out so many, uh, Joe, now. Um, um, we can also do that. So we start with this first one from Marcel van der Schaaf. I think you know him from the brown paper company here in the Netherlands. He's, sure. uh, he's asking, how would you place the function of creativity as in discovering opportunities in this model? Where, where does the role of creativity play in this? Yes. Every, everywhere. If I'm going to go set up a new business on the edge, like I've been proposing in the last 30 minutes, sure, I want creative people. I, I, I want to fill, fill that with creative people. And I want to give the, them incentives to be creative. If I try to hire creative people in the core, in the traditional business, I think traditional businesses chase all the creativity out of them. I think you're told to conform. I think you're told to stay in your box. You're told to do a narrow job. And if you do that narrow job well and keep your nose clean and don't mess up too much, you're going to get promoted to, to up the ladder to another job. But I, I don't think there's much creativity in large organizations. It shouldn't be creative. By definition, it's focused on near-term profit maximization. Now, in the boundaries of near-term profit maximization, okay, there's there's... There's little room for creativity there, some, but little. But are you allowed to throw out the whole business model and say it's broken in five years and we need to be really creative and dump it now and go do new things? That, that's not allowed in the core business. Yeah, that's true. But, and then you get a question from somebody, Raoul Weigegangs. He's dialing in from Copenhagen, I think. Uh, why innovate in corporates in the first place? Uh, yes, they want to grow, but they've proven, proven not to have the competence. So why not buy innovations for growth? Why not, why not buy innovation to grow? So, and, and companies do do that. They, they try to buy innovation. And they try to buy sexy startups. There's two problems with that. Well, there's, there's a lot of problems with that. From the seller side, why, why do sellers sell? They sell because they have an expectation that the growth is gone. If something is really going fast, do you sell it or do you keep it? 
I think the mindset generally might be you keep it if, if you see continued growth going forward, or if you're desperate, you sell, or if you're, you know, you built it over 20 years and you want to retire and pull some cash out, you might sell. But, but think of the seller's motivation to sell something interesting and high growth. So I'm, I'm always perplexed by that. The second answer is we know that two thirds of all M&A fail still to this day, big companies, small companies, globally, all sectors, two thirds of all M&A fails. It fails because of poor intent. The, the thinking behind it wasn't good. It fails because of we overpaid, uh, so wrong price. And then thirdly, it fails because of poor integration. We had no way of really putting these things together. So buying innovation, I think is, you're still looking down the barrel of a, of a two thirds failure rate. In the core edge model, I'm saying, okay, buy is one of the four tools, buy, build, partner, and invest. And if you buy, do it differently this time. Maybe leave it on the edge, maybe leave that independent, maybe leave it alone so it can continue that double digit, double digit growth. But when you try to take that, that high growth asset and bring it into a low growth environment and turn it over to a, executives that have never managed a high growth asset, I think you're dramatically increasing your failure rate. So I would say, yes, you can still buy some innovation. Careful what you're buying. Why is the, in, why is the investors really selling? And then secondarily, be careful how you position it within the company. And if you take a high growth asset and give it to a, ultimately a group of low growth managers, I think you're going to dramatically increase your failure rate. Yes, that's probably what a lot of people see happening indeed. And we have a question uh, going forward on that from Lawrence Hamerling, who is saying, uh, hi Mark, an edge organization will focus on growth, disrupting the industry. What profile of people should run it? You were saying something about it already, uh, but maybe you can elaborate a little bit on it. How many percentage, uh, how many or percentage will come from the core organization versus hiring top new talents? Uh, great question, Lawrence. And, uh... Thank you for that. Again, I said earlier, you guys have the answer. You know the answer. You look at, you look at high growth unicorns you admire uh, anywhere in the world, right? And there's some in Europe and there's, there's certainly a lot here in, in my backyard of, of Silicon Valley. You wanna hire those kind of people. You wanna build in your edge organization, you wanna build a portfolio of people that are turning down jobs at Google, that are turning down jobs at, at, at the most admired digital companies you can think of. You want the top quartile from TU Delft, and, and not only TU Delft, not only in the Netherlands, but, but go down to ETH in Zurich and you know, hire, hire people from Stanford. And you, know, you, you are on a hunt for top quartile talent and you're going to appeal to them by saying, we have a balance sheet, you know, we're backed by, by one of the Netherlands biggest companies, and we're going to give you opportunities to go do amazing things. And, and we want you to consider working here because we're working on a portfolio of big problems that may even be bigger than financial services, right? We may look at the intersection of financial services and healthcare, or financial services and telecoms or financial services and transportation, but you know, the, 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 the opportunities, the portfolio of things we could do, and I'm just answering Lawrence's question, say from a Avi and Amro perspective is enormous. And those people are largely going to come uh, from a pipeline of people that are turning down jobs at, at, at say a Google, for example, I, I think very few are going to come from the existing organization. What AXA did is AXA said, we want to be fair to those people in the existing organization. They did some behavioral testing on people and looked at their entrepreneurial capability. They had to make sure they could do it. But then what they said was, here's, here's some projects you can work on in the edge that we've identified. Uh, and they identified about 30 different focus areas. And they said, we need leadership teams for these companies. You can certainly apply but we need to tell you that you're going to take a pay cut. You're going to be on a little more of an entrepreneurial pay cut uh, class 
than a corporate pay class. And we're going to compensate in a big pile of equity. So if you're really entrepreneurial and you fit this mold, you're going to be happy with that. You're going to be more risk embracing and you're going to like the idea of upside and not trying to hold on to your salary. Right. And, and additionally, there's no job to go back to. This is a Vikings burn the ships approach that, that AXA has taken. And that filtered out about 90% of the people, which, which in a roundabout way answers the question that perhaps a lot of these people in the corporate world aren't that risk embracing anyway. If they're not willing to take a, let's say a 20% pay cut for the, for the potential upside of a lot of equity, then they, you've let the markets kind of speak for themselves. They've self-selected out that that's not the profile for them. And that's, I think that's okay. Versus, hey, we're doing all these new startups internally and we, and we just had this new edge organization. Anybody that wants to come over can. But you've not, you've not made them jump over a bar. You've not made them, you've not tested them whether they're entrepreneurial. And to ask them, hey, are you prepared to take a 20% pay cut for some future unknown pile of equity? And if they say no, I would say that's a very, very strong indicator that they're probably not going to be that innovative as an, as an entrepreneur. Yeah, and then because you were also advocating the, um, because you have the, the mindset of the uh, CEO and the management team of the former company to deal with as well, right? So we get Correct. one about that uh, from Nana Omland, and he's saying, hi, Mark, you are advocating direct, direct report to CEO. This requires certain mindset and capability with CEO and the CEO office and his or her board support. Can you elaborate a little bit on this? Sure. This... And I, I've said to some of you, I, I've had direct conversations with many of you in the last year on, on this larger topic and on this specific topic. There are 5,000 companies in the world, publicly traded companies, with at least a billion euros in revenue. And, and there's probably 50 of those in the Netherlands, 40 or 50, um, and a few private ones as well. But, but you know, it's, it's, a, it's, it's several dozen companies I, I, I don't know exactly, but it's something like 40 to 50 companies. We, we all know them, the largest. Maybe it's 60. You have to find, in my view, a CEO who's young enough in his or her career that in action means it's going to have personal impact on them. And probably also he or she is physically young enough, they might still be in their 40s, to understand this stuff and, and recognize the world is changing and they need to place some bets. My biggest fear where this won't work is a company where the CEO, he or she is north of 60. They've probably already announced a retirement date or they're thinking about a retirement date. They've been in their job for five or six years. They're 62. You know, everyone knows they're going to be leaving the business in 21 or 22. And that organization typically is frozen. And it's frozen because of the 10 direct reports to the CEO, four or five think they have a legitimate shot at getting it. <laughs> and, and everyone is playing the political game of musical chairs. They're actually being tremendously risk adverse. They're not going to do anything that, 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 that increases their own personal risk or vulnerability in a big company. So if you've got a 61 or 62 year old CEO who's been in that job five or maybe even six years and the, 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 the office chatter or buzz is that they're gonna leave in the next year or two, that becomes an exceedingly difficult environment to do something like this in. They're, 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 their short-term focus and, and, and everyone below them is, is short-term focused. Um, so in, in those kind of environments, it's going to take an extraordinary special CEO to say, I'm listening, tell me more. Um, some, and I've met a few CEOs that are prepared to begin to have that conversation and that are open-minded and they're saying, what real legacy am I leaving for the firm? And I want to put it on a 
solid trajectory going forward. So I'm personally in some of those conversations, but, it, but admittedly, it's a lot harder to convince them to do something that looks a little bolder than to do nothing and to just sit tight for 18 months and just slash budgets and slash costs and close factories. Because that's, that's easy to do. It is, because do you feel this changing anything in the approach to innovation when it's because of crisis like we are in at the moment? Uh, maybe the change of shareholder value towards the future, that other things are more important than just the basic earning as much money as possible? Do you see any changes going on there at the moment? Yes and no. I, I, a lot of people are paying lip service. And, and again, I, I, I thank everyone for, for staying on the call. I know you, you all have a lot of choices with your time uh, in, this, in this environment. And so, so thanks for sticking along. We all get bombarded with covert webinars and everyone's tried to figure out what's happening. I think there's some polite language about this new normal and, and we're going to start you know, better managing all of our stakeholders. That, that's been a constant drumbeat for almost 10 years now. I don't, I don't think COVID has made that any newer. The reality is stock markets are down, share prices are getting hammered, revenue is falling off, employees have been fired and more will be fired. Um, all this pretty language around doing non-financial things and we need to step back and rethink everything. We are, we are still in capitalistic markets around the world, structured on short-term results. Companies are fighting for their very survivability right now. And all that matters is right-sizing their, their operating budget to, to continue to trade in a very, very difficult environment that, that could go on for a year, could go on for three or even four years, right? If, it's a year if we can find a vaccine and slowly begin building these pieces back together. It's three or four years by some economist estimates if this is truly a depression that's hard to get out of. So I, 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 you know, there's nice language that we need to renew thinking around shareholders and, and it's more than money. I, I hear that. I hear that very loudly and I, I, I empathize with that. And, and, and then I juxtapose that against the reality of these companies are publicly traded, they have shareholders and those shareholders want returns. And if you're not providing it, they're gonna sell your shares and they're gonna go buy new shares and something else and you're gonna be in further financial decline. So CFOs, financial directors, uh, they are under a tremendous amount of pressure to uh, uh, trade off those two conflicting values. Yeah, yeah. maybe a little bit in line with that, we have a question from Hans saying, uh, Mark, agree with your story, but it's a well-known concept. Real, no, real problem is that it's not accepted. So how to change that? And he thinks it's not a matter of the bonus. So I have seen flavors of this going back, as I said, 75 years. I've seen Lockheed Martin, very early talk about this. I haven't seen many, well, I, in, in two years of research, I've, I'm tracking roughly 30 companies that I have found so far that are legitimately working on this. I think what Hans may be alluding to is kind of a broader market of companies and some confusion on what's really happening, right? And so, um, I tried to isolate this concept with those criteria to say, you're only looking at an edge organization if it meets this criteria. So when somebody says, hey, this is well known and it's not accepted, I'd, I'd, I'd be delighted at, at some future date Hans to say, who are you talking about and what do they try to do? And look, look at these criteria and is it, is it really a fit? Because I'm not finding many that have fit those criteria that aren't, aren't having some um, some success. Um, take take uh, 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 Scott Anthony from InnoSight, and he wrote a book a couple years ago called Dual Transformation. And he's similar thinking, 
but he draws those two circles overlapping. And his, his assertion, and, and this is where I take debate with, with Scott, is Inosite's view is there's synergies between those, the core and the edge. And my strong view is as soon as you have that overlap between the two, the death star of the core is gonna suck the soul out of those startups. And it doesn't know what it's doing building startups. So I, I, I think, and again, Hans, I, we, can, we can go offline and have this debate, but there's some nuances to core edge that I, I think are very fresh and very new. And I'm seeing companies like AXA and Philip Morris and Orsted and AB InBev and, and uh, Swiss Post and others begin to accelerate you know, with, this, um, with this approach. So um, I, I do believe it's tied to, to bonus and pay. What, what gets measured gets done. Uh, but it's also equal to putting big ambitious goals out there, right? Why, why, did, why does somebody you know, want to go work at a startup when, when it's perceived to have lower pay? Well, one argument is they do it for the equity and the upside. Another argument is they do it because they want to, quote, change the world. They, they, they are attracted to working on big vexing problems and working around other perceived smart people also working on, you know, big complex problems. So, uh, Hans, partly it's a function of bonus, and I think partly it's a function of attracting people that want to work on bigger problems and be surrounded by others that are working on bigger problems. And the, uh, when it comes to the people that want to work on bigger problems or the kind of people you would need for this. Um, we actually have a question from Marco Giannotte from Gierte here in the Netherlands. You've met Marco as well, I think. Oh, um, yes. Uh, and he's saying, why the hell do you want to work for an edge company? Isn't that second best for an entrepreneurial spirit? Right. This is, if, if you're an entrepreneur, if you're a true entrepreneur, Historically, you just go do your own startup. Fine. Odds are, odds are very tough. Odds are very tough that you're going to build a company and it used to be like one in 10,000. You can have an idea and it becomes a publicly traded company. Odds are very tough. And, lot, and lots and lots and lots can go wrong. This is probably a middle ground. Would you want to give them all of your idea and all your IP? Probably not. A, a real entrepreneur is just going to go do it themselves. They may fail 10 times and finally get it right. I'd argue that this model will, will if you're paying equity and you have a balance sheet behind the, the portfolio of startups, I, I think you can have a lot of success with people that might ultimately end up being their own entrepreneur. But in the middle, in the meantime, this is a happy medium. But for a successful entrepreneur that's already built three businesses, sure, this isn't for them. This is addressing the problem that large corporates around the world are in long, slow decline, and all the things they're trying to do aren't working. And I'm proposing a bolder model to get more results than, than their hackathons and accelerators and CVCs and innovation labs historically have not delivered for them. Yes. I think we have time for one more question and then yes. I, you've all been very generous with your time today. <laughs> I was just going to say we almost have to um, uh, finish. Thank, thank you all. I really, really yeah. appreciate your, uh, your time and attention and, and dialogue today. This, um, this is something I continue to work on full time with with research, um, an emerging book project is in here and, and some other things. So uh, keep the ideas coming, keep the criticism and the pushback coming. Um, we're just trying to make this thinking better. We continue to work with clients uh, uh, on this topic as well. So any other ideas uh, you have to help move this forward and create a greater understanding, uh, I certainly appreciate. Okay, well great. Thank you, Mark, so much for your time. Uh, for dialing in and sharing your insights and expertise with us. We want to sh uh, thank everybody in the webinar for taking the time to uh, uh, join us here today. Um, we will be sharing the presentation of Mark and the link to uh, the video uh, with all of you after the webinar. 
um, so you can share it with colleagues or revisit it again. If you have any other questions, you can connect with us via email or via LinkedIn uh, with Mark as well, and we will make sure uh, all of our contact details, including Mark's, will be in our final email to you as well. So thank you very much, everybody. And um, we hope to see you again on one of the other webinars that we will be organizing in the next couple of weeks. Thank you for your time.